So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm going to let people in while we're chatting. Welcome to the ECI studio. We're really, really pleased you're here. This is just a forum where we have thought-provoking educators, practitioners come join us in terms of sharing their expertise. I just want to go over, first of all, what we hope to achieve today. So when we think about the ECI studio, it's the idea of connecting the heart and the head and the hands. And I just want to explain what that means. The heart means we just want all of us to start building a community of learners. So if you might see some, I've said, goodness, Claudia, I think you're fabulous. You might write to her and say, I would love your email address. I would love to connect with you. So the heart is the idea of building a sense of communities here. The head is those provocations that we have Kathleen and Trisha here today to really get us thinking. And then the hands is, what are those takeaways, literally those takeaways that you can leave this session with in terms of impacting you as a professional, as a learner, and as an individual. So it's kind of exciting to think of working this way and when we look at virtual facilitation. So the heart, the head, and the hands is how we like to think of the ECS studio. How do we do that? Oops, sorry. I'm supposed to delete that one, so don't even see that slide. Close your <laughs> eyes on that one. You didn't see that one, okay? So I'm gonna have to cut that on the video. Equal, share your Twitter handle, ECS if you're tweeting, ECS Studio. Breakout session, we're going to have equal voice. And please keep your video on when we are in a breakout session. If you feel more comfortable in the larger group to have your camera off, that's no problem. But we do like to see some faces. It's really hard to just talk to a black box with your name. So if you want to smile, sometimes it's easier when we are virtual that you can hide yourself so you don't have to look at yourself. I know that sounds odd because like when you're in a meeting, you never have a mirror in front of you looking at yourself. So if you want to hide yourself and lastly, you are on mute. But I think we're a small enough group or have that. I know Kathleen, Trisha will be in dialogue so you can definitely um, join us. Just want to give you some updates on what's coming up on the ECS studio. In January, we have advice to our younger self. Um, this is from the Women in Education Group. I am chair of that committee. By the way, my name is Nancy Scucciarini, and I am a facilitator for ECIS, and I have the privilege to work with these two, Estelle and Neve, and they're presenting this session. Next, we have a book club, which has been really successful. Everyone said, it's not gonna work. They were wrong, it worked. We're talking about how do we facilitate professional learning at our schools? Who doesn't do that in terms of working with your teams? And we're going on our third session with Vanessa. Next, we actually have the author of the book joining us, which we feel very privileged. Lori Cohen is going to be um, adding her insight about writing the book. And lastly, in February, we have the wonderful Joel, who's talking about we're going to have some difficult conversations. We decided to really talk about those conversations that people don't want to talk about in terms of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I look forward to this conversation. So now we go to our guests who are the initiators for the Unhinged Collaboration. Um, two wonderful people that I'm gonna give a personal insight to. Um, you're talking about two educators, two leaders that I feel are really quite impactful when it comes to international education. Kathleen being the head of school at the International School of Helsinki, and then Trisha with her being an advocate for LGBTQ and what she's doing in terms of inclusion. Both of them, I feel, just the impact. They're not doing just with schools, but with individuals. And what I appreciate the most with these two educators is their approach in terms of elevating voice and being inclusive in terms of working with schools and also who we are as a community of being an in international educators. So this is when I stop talking and we can unmute and give a very big round of applause for Kathleen and for Trisha. So stop sharing. We can go. I didn't hear anything. Everyone, unmute. We gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! Woo right here. So Trish and Kathleen, thank you for being guests and sharing your work with the podcast. Thank you, Nancy, and we really appreciate having uh, having us being as uh, guests tonight. And we hope um, the guests also feel that we want this to be a, a communal experience and that uh, please remove all formality um, uh, throughout tonight. If you just want to unmute at some point or ask a question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll turn over to um, Trisha first, who maybe we can talk about 
what we're doing, what this, this is about. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Kathleen. And, and everyone, thank you so much for being here. I know this is not an easy time to you know, find those extra hours. So we really appreciate you just being so generous with your time and energy today. So Kathleen and I are here to, to talk to you about a little mini project that we are collaborating on that's called Unhinged Collaboration. It's a podcast where we're hoping to have conversations about collaboration that sort of shift what often gets centered inside of those conversations. So, you know, some of the language that we use in describing it is that it's really the queer gaze for the collaboration maze. Uh, and I should say up top right now too, we're also trying to do something meta with this session. You know that this session is being recorded and we're hoping actually to turn this conversation into a podcast episode itself. Now, having that said, we also really wanna respect everyone's privacy. Um, so if we head off into breakout rooms, that won't be recorded. If while you are sharing something, you don't want that to be shared, just drop me a note in the chat. I'll make a little bit of a note of that and we will be very, very sure to respect your space and your privacy. So when we talk about the queer gaze, um, Kathleen, I'm wondering if you want to take this quote and talk sure. a little bit about what the queer gaze has meant or means currently to you. So many people understand this, this, uh, these terms like the male gaze or the female gaze when it comes to film. This is something that's been kind of out there for, for a bit about um, kind of how scenes are set in art and in ways that um, individuals are objectified in certain ways. Maybe you've been less familiar with this idea of the queer gaze. And um, Louis uh, Fratino here uh, gives a really kind of short definition that's a way of seeing something that hasn't been seen before. And, and so what we mean by this is that um, in, in this case, collaboration, that there, there are hidden, um, hidden structures, hidden agendas in the way that we work with each other that might have not been um, understood and what we're kind of uh, undercover, trying to undercover in this, uh, these podcasts and these conversations is to show these hidden assumptions. Um, and then what we hope ends up happening is that you have more trusting conversations. You have um, better collaborative work with your colleagues um, in whatever field you're in. It doesn't have to be just education. And also even, you know, in your families and, and friendships as well. So the, the queer gaze is, is saying there might be something fundamentally um, off about the structure of how things are happening. And sometimes this is with, this is hierarchy, for, for example. Uh, we had recently a guest, uh, Ryan Prasad, if you listen to that episode, who is a, a man of color who is um, a school leader in Brazil. And he had talked about which I thought was a, so insightful. He talked about when he was in um, conversations with his leadership team, um, which is an all white male group, or at least all white um, group, um, how there's always this, there's always this piece of hesitation. There's always this piece of protecting himself and his vulnerability when he's in that kind of setting. And this might not be understood by the other team members as to what he's bringing to the table, what he's afraid to show at the table, and what he might also be demeaned if he would reveal this at the table. So when we're thinking of this queer gaze, this is what we're looking at. We're trying to think, okay, wait a second. Um, are there some underlying structures here that we're missing that we need to identify, we need to expose so that um, uh, we can we can seek liberation in these sorts of conversations. So that's kind of where we're coming at the moment. Um, and kind of uncovering what people have not seen. Tricia? And I think, you know, even just taking the assumption that inside of your organization, that when we say we're going to do something collaboratively, that everybody has sort of a shared definition of that, or has even taken the time to share lived experiences. I think often in many learning organizations, the the point of operation is really, oh, well, folks know how to collaborate. They enjoy collaboration. And I think actually when you when you dig into that a little bit and you talk more to folks as we're doing, um, that foundation work hasn't been done and we're not necessarily doing enough to share those 
stories of what actually has collaboration look like for you? Um, you know, when you tell yourself the story of what your work is like inside of teams, what do you think of your own sort of positionality? What do you think of your own leadership? And where do some of those narratives come from? Um, and how might they be, again, influenced by what Kathleen was saying, the power dynamics that are at play too? So the show really is looking to say, when we're talking about collaboration, what must we also be talking about? So some of the episodes have looked at the idea of trust as well. What are some of the assumptions that are being made about trust? So I wanna pause here um, in the chat, just give you some think time here. What are some of the concepts that you think need a little more attention, need a little more talk time? So when we're talking about collaboration, what else must we, must we consider? What else must we have a conversation about? So I'll give you, Give you just a moment. Would love to know another concept. You know, we, we mentioned that trust has come up, vulnerability. Would love to see what some others are, are thinking. What else might we pay a little more attention to? Yes, absolutely. Positional power. Team dynamics, yes. Quiet people, those with social anxiety. Yes, thank you, Claudia, for that. And 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 Trisha and I will, will both admit that we're truly introverts, which is often hard for people to believe that we, we get in front of the camera this way. Intentionality of building trust, not just saying it that we trust. Thank you. Jenny, who is not in the collaboration and why? Yeah, absolutely. And this is often the case, isn't it? And the root of many, many of our issues. Yeah, that, that idea of belonging and understanding, um, you know, when we talk about cultivating belonging, how also, you know, the reality is that that needs to look different for different folks and it needs to continue to evolve. You know, Kathleen kind of sharing, we're both incredibly introverted, right? So my needs within a team aren't, you know, once Kathleen knows how my, my collaborative preferences might work, she also, you know, sort of understands that's not permanent. That's not at a permanent state. If I'm going through some sort of crisis with my family, uh, if I'm having a health issue, right? All of these sort of things mean that there's lots of different wheels in motion at all times. And so I think sometimes one of the assumptions that I've experienced in learning organizations is folks will say, well, we have collaborative norms. So there, there we go. We all know these, you know, the, we've got the norms, right? So then it should all work out. But that completely, I think, doesn't take into account the, the many different contexts of our personal lives, of our collegial relationships, of even like the weather that day, what's happening in society, all of those things, right? So I think um, if we're going to say, well, we have the norms done, we're doing an incredible disservice to the individuals um, and all of the, the complexity that they bring to our learning organization. So alongside of our podcast episodes, we're also trying to make sure that each episode has some sort of tool to play with that also kind of complements that idea of it's evolving when we're talking about collaboration when we're talking about co-authoring a definition a working definition of what collaboration might look like um, we we really do want to offer folks maybe some tools to tinker with to try out right to be more experimental in your approach and realize that we have to keep being experimental so on slide four if you click that image, um, that's a downloadable that you can try out if you would like. Um, this is what we call our stances that serve us best. And I should probably qualify that and say, this is about in the moment right now, trying to find the one that we most need, right? So this is, this is meant to be a menu that asks us, do we need the bamboo stance? Do we need the mushroom stance? Do we need the succulent stance and each of those has a question and it's really meant to slow that collaborative process down 
and not rush through and not assume, okay, if I'm, you know, partnered with Nancy and I'm partnered with Kathleen, they both have the same mindset that I do right now. That often isn't true, right? So how can we pause down? How can I check in with them and see like, what do you need from the group right now? What do you need from me right now? And these three stances are sort of inspired by nature because to get a little meta with it, we also like the idea of just pausing, being aware of what's in our environment and perhaps being inspired by that as sort of another reminder to pause and slow down. So on slide five, we have sort of a, a scaffolded new protocol here, right? So our group together right now, what are some of the stances that we might co-create? And we've scaffolded this for you. We've given you three different, uh, again, stealing from nature, the cactus, the seedling, the pine cone. And we'd like to see what questions our group might come up with. So I think we're going to have our first breakout room now for you to play around with this slide five. And when I, when we say the cactus, the seedling, the pine cone, those are optional, right? If you want your collaborative stances to be inspired by something completely different, please go with it. We just wanted to give you a little bit of a starting point. So what are some of the other stances that we need within our teams? What are some of the other questions that we need to stop, pause, make more time and space for? So in your breakout room, we'd love for you just to have like a, a five minute conversation. Can you come up with one new stance? or one new question. When you think about your time in teams, what do you wish folks slowed down and got curious about? When we come back outside of those breakout rooms, we love to hear the questions or the stances that you have come up with. Um, but when I say that, you know, sharing is always completely 100% optional. So if you want to share in the chat when you come back, we'd love that if when you come back, you'd like to share instead by unmuting. Uh, we're also super happy with that as well. So completely up to you. We're going to have some small groups, five minutes. What's one stance that you might be able to come up with or one new question? All right, y'all ready for- Let's go. Let's go for it. Here we go, right. everybody. You on the other side. are going to open. Make sure you introduce yourselves and say hello. All right. I'm, well done. I'm going to pause the recording. Yes. So in case have we you have to remember because you're in charge of the recording now. So much responsibility. <laughs> too much. Too much. Perfect. I'm going to see if I can get some tweets out there while you're speaking. That's where I forgot to shut off my microphone. That's okay. And I'll. The time is on, so. And you can broadcast if you want to say anything to them. Okay. As a reminder. Um, I might just remind them that it is slide four. Uh, they should have access to it because they already copied and pasted from it. Good, okay. So well organized. I think you're still recording. Am I? Yes. I'm, for, for me, it says it's paused. Okay. For me, am I recording? Maybe you're also recording. <laughs> that would be odd. I thought you could only. Let's see. Ooh, five minutes is always so much faster than I think it's going to be. Uh, folks, if you'd want to, if you would like to share the stance you came up with, the question you came up with, both, mm. none of the above. Uh, again, feel free to to share in the chat or um, to unmute. I can talk a little bit about our group, and maybe they can write some things as as uh, we're talking. So, uh, we were we were talking about kind of root vegetables being. Mm hidden under the surface, like in a staff meeting where there's maybe all these great ideas that are not being exposed. 
and the facilitator looking for different ways to kind of dig that out and find out. And we had some ideas around use of technology with like pulse surveys or cahoots or things like this during a meeting where people feel like they have a voice but don't have to show their vulnerability in some ways. Um, but we really love this idea. We were talking about different types of root vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, you know, parsnips. Um, but I think we, we, I think we got stuck on the potato stance. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because, you know, potatoes are also incredibly versatile, right? Like now you have me thinking of all of the amazing things that we can cook <laughs> and prepare with potatoes too. Yeah. So I love the idea of the potato stance because in my mind that also reads as like the potato gets underestimated sometimes, yes. right? Like always available almost year round, right? But such an important starch you can do so much with it if you uh if you get a little bit creative i've lived a lot of my life in eastern europe um and it's often the case that uh, when we do the survey for the cafeteria many of our staff members are like more potatoes this is what comes out in our in our seven rosemary was in ireland i think maybe she would find the same <laughs> Love it. Thank you for sharing the potato stance. Anybody else want to unmute or take over the chat? Um, or uh, again, even just, you know, if you want to talk about how you might use a resource like that with your team too, we'd, we'd love to hear more. So um, Sherry, no need to raise your hand. Just Sherry go ahead Marshall, come on up. Tell us what you guys did. You so, Sherry. <laughs> you know, we can't, one of the, one of the uh, stances that we came up with was, and, and talked a little bit about was the idea of the rose stance so that um, it's both, it has thorns. So you have to be careful. You might have to have courage to step into a space knowing that it might be painful. And yet it's also beautiful, has a great scent. So, so then possibly strengthening the relationship or the connection then among the group um, as a result of that. So, and then we had people try out and share a little bit about um, looking through, I think the pine cone stance um, as well. Perfect, loved it. Thank you. I love the idea of the rose because um, I think we have so many different kind of just um, historical ideas of what that means. And I think we can think through what that means in relationships in so many different ways. Nice job, everyone. I'm also thinking, and this is, um, I was recently just visiting with family and my folks have like this, this beautiful little like mini rose garden. And of course, you know, for the winter, you have to cut them all back, right? And so mm. I kind of also, Sherry, now I'm thinking with some of our stances, at what point in the year do we actually have to just say, let's give ourselves some time and space and like have a little bit of hibernation so that that stance can come back later on when we need it. So also when are we building in like the restful pose for the cycle of that stance? So thanks so much. Anybody else wanna, wanna share a stance or a question they came up with? Um, or, you know, again, I'm, I'm just going to share my screen here for a moment. Um, you know, we, we kind of were playing around with this idea of nature as inspiring, but I'm wondering, there are also many other themes that, you know, thinking about local context, you might want to play around with. So any other thoughts on that exercise, or maybe it's not about plants and flowers? What else, you know, what other themes might you want to explore with your team or what other questions um, came to mind from your group? It's a very TOK kind of question as well for those who are in that space. Anything in the chat? Just makes me think of this, you know, anytime you're thinking about poetry and I'm I'm also kind of a poet on the side, it's always, you know, how we're connecting to different imagery um, and thinking of your local context, I think is also often a very powerful um, idea. So for whatever region or country or a community you're in, you know, the symbolic food, the symbolic kind of landscape, um, sometimes that plays into um, deeper meanings for your staff members as well when they connect to um, uh, to the landscape or the geography of of their community and 
geographies of community um, appear in many different ways. It can be also the way that you, um, you know, share food or have parties and all these sorts of things. So don't be afraid to think through these sorts of things with uh, members of your team, with what makes sense to um, who are the, who's in the room with you. And what I love about that idea is, you know, Kathleen, I would say one of my issues with a lot of collaborative norms is you're taking this notion of what collaboration is and just sort of copy pasting it rather than co-creating it with within the folks who are going to be doing that collaboration together. And what you were just saying about the geography of the campus, I see real power in saying, you know what, we're going to have an hour just to go around and notice and where do we want to take inspiration from right what do we see in our neighborhoods what do we see in our classrooms what do we see in our colleagues spaces right that might really hyper contextualize the inspiration for how it is that we collaborate together so again i know a lot of this is like well that's going to take time truly high functioning teams i think know how to slow down and that they and they understand it's not a well we started slow and now we can go fast all the time no you need to be almost building in those cycles of slow so i love that idea of just geography of our area um you know a, again like maybe it's even over lunch and pulling from the different flavors from different folks lunches um, and, and really kind of tapping into that idea of noticing and making it really sensory i think is is, is pretty cool and so, we talk we talk about in uh, sorry Trish but we 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 talk about also on the podcast often this whole point of being slow and this this idea of that to build community to build any real change in your team in your partnerships in your school um it is a grave mistake to move um too fast towards what you think are the outcomes um and you know, establishing real trust with each other is the only way anything is going to happen that is going to be meaningful and long lasting. And there's, I think we probably have two or three episodes where this has come up again and again about um, real change takes time. But if you know exactly where you're heading towards uh, with that change, um, and, you know, many of us in this room tonight are in that DEIJ space. Um, that means first getting everyone that you need to have on board to be on board completely with you. Um, and that's going to take time. Um, but once that that has been congealed in a group, then then you can really move on. And, you know, so um, we rush with collaboration and we throw teachers to, you know, five tables in a room, go, here's your sticky notes and we're going to have a, you know, a learning walk. And, you know, boom, it's all done, but we know it's not all done. So thank you. So I have to mention Kathleen and Tricia, what you're saying is exactly what, I work with middle leaders. And one of the areas that I focus on so much is the idea of the intentionality, I'll use that word again, of those inclusion. I wanna say activities, but I'm gonna call them learning opportunities. Because when you use the word icebreaker, it seems like it's not based upon a learning outcome. But when you talk about the idea that inclusion, that you are working towards a common goal, and if you spend your time developing and elevating the human capital of your team, and it's exactly what you said, Kathleen, then you're able to move forward with those learning tasks that's moderated grading or looking at student work more impactful because you already have an idea of who you are as a group of learners within your team. And what I've seen is so many principals, they don't want to, I, they use the word, I can't waste my time spending for the staff to get to know one another. I'm like, but that's your human capital. Your human capital then produces your decision-making capital, your professional capital. And that's a lost art because they just want to get, they, they look at all the initiatives. Yes, and absolutely, absolutely Nancy. Saying, really resonates. And I think with middle leaders, who has ever worked with middle leaders, that intentionality is so important. And and and, and this piece requires storytelling and the, mm -hmm. the ability to have stories being told. There's a great question here from Yasmin, where she said, um, where is the ground more and less fertile? When and what can be planted there? And how are we increasingly aware that some things take time? And to grow things takes time. And but that, that soil needs to be fertile. And the way you fertilize that soil 
is having deep, meaningful conversations with people where people can bring their authentic selves to um, the conversation. And that you need trust for that. You need vulnerability to be exposed for that. Um, and that comes from the leadership as well. So those who are in this leadership space, if you're not showing your vulnerability, nobody in the room is going to show vulnerability either. Um, so these are really important um, discussions. And I know we're just talking about potatoes, but come on, this is good stuff here. Uh, you know, and, and with that, I think it's also about releasing control, right? Because I think often the other mistake we see is now is the time to talk about thing X. Oh, why? You want to talk about thing Y? No, 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 no. That now is not the time for that. And uh, Adrian Marie Brown has this great sort of idea that I'm going to paraphrase, hopefully not too poorly. When you think of a tree, the way that a tree grows. So Yasmin, your idea of, again, you can't hurry something, right? You need the fertile earth. You've got roots under the soil. Adrian Marie Brown talks about a tree grows because it has these different components, you know, the root structure, the leaves, the branches, they're each doing their own thing. They're dramatically different parts, but they each need each other and they're not in competition. They are helping one another, even though they are so dramatically different. And so I think that's the other part is that, um, you know, to that point of we have to be aware, as Jasmine said, that some things take time. And within a team, we each need to be doing different things with our time and our energy sometimes and, and appreciating that. And I think letting go of the control over how that growth is happening and realizing that we are going to need different parts to be functioning in different ways that come together. So part of you know this conversation about investing in individuals, in having more conversations, this is really the last resource that we wanted to leave you with on slide seven. Either you can scan that QR code or you can actually click on it or you can click where it says a menu. Um, and this has been designed as a tool that is intentionally built for mobile. So Kathleen and I wanted to give folks a few prompts where it is you and one thought partner, go for a walk, find a nice place to sit on campus, uh, be somewhere different where you have this menu of different prompts. And each of the conversation starters is also based on a book that we have found useful. So we're hoping that not only does the conversation menu help you and a thought partner get to know one another, but also maybe we've got some different texts and resources here that further make that soil a little bit more fertile. So for each of them, you'll see there's two different options. So there's a statement and there's two questions. So we wanted to build choice into choice. And what we're gonna do right now is just sort of take a moment, let you pick from this menu, from this option, Later on, if you are curious about any of these texts, what you can simply do is click on the book and you'll make your way over to it. But we're actually going to take some space away from talking. Silence, I think, is also a component of collaboration. Give you a moment here to scroll through that menu, find the option that appeals to you, and then we'll head back into those breakout rooms um, to have a conversation. And if you don't feel yet like you'd like to share your response to that question. We completely get that. Some of us are complete strangers here. No worries. But um, if instead you'd like to share in the breakout room how you might use a menu like this, or if there's another book that you think would make for an excellent prompt, you can you can share that as well. So I'm going to be quiet, give you about Trisha, a moment. Can you here. put up the, the QR code one more time so oh, people yes. get a chance to click on that if they didn't get that? Yep. So you should be able to scan that or click on it or click where it says a menu. Let me know if that's not working and I can, uh, I'll put the direct link to the menu over there in the chat. Otherwise I'll be quiet and then we'll, uh, we'll take some space in our breakout rooms again to uh, share some of our thoughts in regards to any of the prompts or what you would do with the menu itself. Let me know again if you'd like that link over there in the chat.
Okay, folks, so we're going to have about nine minutes in the breakout rooms to again, share your response to any of the prompts, or perhaps just share the prompt that drew you in, in this moment in time, or perhaps uh, share how you might use a menu like this with someone you collaborate with at your learning organization. We'll see you on the other side of the breakout rooms. Thanks again. Everyone, you have nine minutes with a 10 second countdown. Okay, some people are not going in. There they go. Miranda. Okay, everybody's in. All right. So when we get back, I might ask you to do your. Okay. Uh, you said number one, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, that goes there. Oh, let me stop. And I know, Nancy, you were really, oh, sorry, uh, Ruba, I think I just interrupted you. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, we were actually uh, in the little talk that we had in the breakout room, we were saying that change is basically unavoidable. We were talking about one of the prompts where uh, we don't have to pay attention to internal nor external critique, but change. And... Um, uh, it's one of the most important points that uh, change is happening anyway. So uh, it's more important to focus on making it a good one instead of um, like paying attention to other stuff. Yeah, and that's, you know, that reminds me of, I feel like, and, you know, I, I can't remember where I picked up this tip, but whoever taught me to build this into my practice regularly was to really just stop and question the story I'm telling myself about what I'm doing or how it's operating to always like, you know, it's sometimes an unreliable narrator, right? So if I'm being hypercritical of myself and that's the voice inside of my head, that's the story I'm telling myself, I need to stop and question is that narrator super reliable um, or, or maybe do I need to just sort of push pause on that, on that voice for a little bit? Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Anybody else, any, any thoughts on the prompts or, or ways to use the menu? Nancy, I know you were sort of drawn in by that, that first prompt and maybe actually I'll share my screen and pull this back up. Yes, I always find collaboration an interesting you know, looking at international schools, looking at their context and their culture. Um, I love the the second one, where, what did it say? It was, how does collaboration invite us to navigate uncertainty? And knowing some of the people in here, I, I think first of all, ambiguity, ambiguity is inherent in leadership. That for me is, and when you're looking at those like complex decisions that need to be made, you need those diverse, perspectives to connect all the dots because they see aspects that we don't see. So when I look at that, how does Collaborate make us navigate uncertainty? I, my first thought is when we're looking at trying to get that uncertainty or getting people to have that, let's say, a confidence to be able to give feedback, it goes back to what we started off with when looking at trust. Um, having an environment where people feel comfortable. I love the work of um, Amy Edmondson with psychological safety. I'm not thrilled about the word psychological safety, but I love the concept that if you want that uncertainty to absolutely be, let's say, articulated in collaboration, there has to be that idea that I'm, I, I can articulate these type of ideas that might be different from everybody else. And using her work, and I love her work because there were five things I always remember that leadership and the facilitator should do is, first of all, it's almost like making it explicit that we want an environment where we have cognitive conflict and that you state it to that group. And that facilitation is really part of the leader who is navigating this team. And then as that leader, one of their responsibilities is to facilitate discussions. Like you were saying, Tricia, where maybe not everyone has to speak, but you're still activating a voice. 
but again, that has to be intentional. So different types of facilitation skills, skills and the ones that you provided are really powerful because they're used to different type of personalities to allow them to activate their voice. And even when you mentioned the norms, yeah, you can have norms, but yet are they checked three times a year? How did you create them within what context, within what culture? Um, I think also when you want that uncertainty and collaboration, you have to create a space for it to allow it to happen. I, I completely agree. And I think, Nancy, what you reminded, what you just said kind of reminds me of how we started this with the queer gaze, right? And I actually think it's really important that if you do have collaborative norms, you stop and you ask the question, how might some of these actually be perpetuating harm? Mm -hmm. Right. I think we sometimes really need to completely flip the script and not assume that a structure we have in place is good because, okay. you know, it's, it's been great to see a lot of folks having conversations around, uh, you know, the, the norm that I, I hear used a lot in learning organizations about mm -hmm. presuming positive intent right. and how actually that can that can create some damage. So I think, mm -hmm. again, uh, and that's you know, how is power shared in a learning organization? Is it okay for us to problematize some of the things that have been a part of the way we do things? And are we willing to, you know, to sort of say, actually, this no longer is what we need. We need something new. But it's what you're saying is, can that conversation you just said, is that what the conversation is going on in schools? Or are mm. they starting every year with their set of norms and going through that same cycle but rather than stopping that cycle and saying, how are this impacting the environment and the learning system we have in front of us right now? How do we stop this cycle? Or do we want to continue this type of repetition that we're having? And I'm a big, I support norms, but I support them in terms of how they're created. How do you monitor them? And are they meeting the needs of the individuals of that organization? Then you can have those conversations. I would argue too, Nancy, that is the structure of the collaboration that's going to take place after that able to handle those norm mm -hmm. norms? So is is the kind of the collaborative kind of um, space that's been provided can allow those to thrive? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about this environment and make things fertile again, we keep on going back to these kind of natural Im images. This is what I'm wondering as well. So if if we said that everyone has can have a voice in this mm -hmm. um, conversation, and we say to people, just raise your hand. You can say whatever you want, but, but, but if it doesn't feel safe to raise your hand, exactly, exactly, then like those those norms cannot become reality or truth. So this is where this some of the assumptions. So one of the things is after creating norms, you might ask the question what would be a scenario where that norm could actually, you know, yeah, be come into play and really happen? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really interesting question to ask the group because then again, it slows everyone down like, oh, yeah, maybe that's, that isn't the, the, the way or the path forward would, would allow that to actually be, in fact, the case. But you brought up a good point. Oh, sorry, Trish, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, please. No, I'm just saying about the idea of facilitation. So if you had a facilitator who's just looking at the way, like you said, Kathleen, such a good point, raise your hand if you agree. Well, believe it or not, anybody who's facilitating learning teams, you need a toolkit. And that's why I'm going to do a little plug for shifting, you know, shifting schools. You know, the idea of using protocols allow for those different voices and different perspectives to be gained. Yes. in trying to build that trusting environment. And right now, leaders, to, that's part of, I feel their responsibility is to learn how to facilitate to allow those different opportunities to take place. Big shout out, yes. Shifting thank school. you, thank you, Nancy. Uh, yeah, we, we appreciate that. And we're actually Pretty working good, huh? on uh, our collection of every year. This is sort of a new thing we've started doing every year. We share a new collection of protocols, it's free. And something that we're actually doing is solicitating, you know, tell me about a scenario or tell me about, you know, kind of a, a hinge point in your collaborative process where you need a protocol. And we're trying to build that, uh, that collection out of uh, what folks are telling us they need. But, you know, when we talk about slowing down, when we talk about, again, understanding okay. power dynamics, this, this is really why Kathleen and I wanted mm -hmm. to have this, these conversations in 
podcast format, right? Because I think there's huge power in, again, going back to what Yasmin said about the fertile ground, I think having conversations that are archived, that are preserved, sometimes we're ready to have a conversation and somebody else in our team isn't. And the power of podcasts is, hey, you know, when you're ready to to think more about that, you know, what, what Kathleen shared about Ryan's episode on vulnerability, maybe something's going on in my life where like, I can't touch that topic right now, mm -hmm. right? It's too raw for me, but that episode exists. Maybe it's like two weeks later, now I'm ready to think more about it. So for me, that's the power of podcasts is I can pause it, I can come back to it, I can share it, we can invite folks in. So, um, you know, Kathleen, you and I creating this, I hope also serves as inspiration for other schools to be thinking, what might we want to podcastify? What are some of the topics that we need to have an extended conversation around that gets preserved so we can share it so that folks can listen to it in the time that they're ready. So the menu that you were looking at today on that last page of that menu, when you click that final last little uh, phone icon, we'd love to hear from you if you want to share more about your response, if you'd be willing to share your response as part of a future episode, we would love that too. But I just think sometimes we, undervalue the power that technology affords us with saying let's take some conversations and make them shareable and make them pausable right um because i i do think there's so many great conversations we have in our learning organizations but unfortunately sometimes the folks that need to be a part of that aren't and can't for very good reasons but podcasts do kind of work like branches of a tree, right? How can we keep branching out and building on conversations? So we would love to have you be the part of a future branch. So please do reach out to Kathleen and I, if you would love to be a part. Um, again, we just, we, we would love to see this grow. We want to bring in as many different perspectives as possible. And, and collecting these voices, um, I think is, is much of some of the work we're doing and some of the things that Nancy has been doing as well with ECIS, she had some of our students from International School of Helsinki recently. And if you were to hear the voices of, of, of how they spoke about their experience, um, it, it, just in, it creates those aha moments for others. And uh, we were talking about in our own little group, my breakout as well, this idea that you know, sometimes collecting stories in, in audio form and having people listen to them later is a much more intimate experience than seeing a written report from, you know, your accreditation team. So how are you going about collecting the voices of your community on a particular topic? Uh, it could be, you know, just simple this about like, what's working in our school with collaboration? What's not working? And you're having people give you like a 30 second audio kind of comment that they'd be willing to share and have other people listen to. So, you know, these, there's, they're, again, using technology to support um, the voices that are not being heard. Um, and, and that's how change happens when those voices are heard. And we can understand the assumptions that we've made that we're wrong. Um, and that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time, being so generous with your energy during a month that um, I think December is a real test. I can't believe you're all here. I yes. I can't believe, first of all, we wanted everyone, please, we need to thank, I think Kathleen and Trisha gave such insight to, first of all, what they're doing with this podcast, but also their passion and energy in terms of elevating voice that really is truly needed. And as they said, the recent interview they have with Ryan, just listening to it, that just resonated in so many other areas of my own life, thinking, how could this one podcast resonate with me? And that's what they're doing. They're making those connections globally, which I feel is quite, that's what we want right now, especially when we look at what's going around in the world. So I thank Trisha and Kathleen. Maybe they'll come back, I hope, I hope for another session because I think okay. this could have gone on for another hour, but it's now five minutes past. I want to respect your time. So everyone, please unmute and give them a big round of applause. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you, thank you. We give this wave as well because we just love them so much. <laughs> okay. I'm making the sounds of my mic too. So. We're doing everything right now. We're doing everything. And I want to thank you. I see some beautiful faces here. My dear friend Michael's here, who I love so much. Sherry, everyone, thank you for being here. Yeah, and I, I hope appreciate you have a lovely holiday. Our next event is with our advice to your youngest self. So I hope you're able to join us as well. So happy holiday holidays. Oh my God. I'm getting <laughs> happy holidays and all the best to you and your families. Love to you all. Love to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. everybody. Thank you.